morning. morning. We welcome you to Freedom's Church this beautiful October morning. We're glad that you could be here at worship in person and online with us as we celebrate be being together in the presence of God to worship God. I have a few announcements for us this morning. Uh, our new Sunday school group for 6th through 8th graders will begin November 7th. Make sure to mark that on your calendar. That is the first Sunday, obviously, in November, and we're looking forward to that being led by Jill and Jay Law. This Wednesday for our F3 at FC, our youth, high school youth group, they're doing a little Halloween party today, so uh, that day, so we're encouraging them to wear their favorite costumes, and we'll have some goodies, and it'll be fun. So spread the word for those teenagers to join us on that. Next Sunday, of course, is Halloween on the calendar, and so we're having our trunk or treat, which we haven't done in a couple of years, and so we're excited to be able to resume that, being hosted by our Parish Life Committee, and it will begin at 5.30 uh, until about 7-ish, as I like to say. Um, we need for you to decorate your vehicles and to hand out candy. You'll be parked in the parking lot, get here before 5.30 so you can get ready. Um, also, we need donations of candy or goodies to be able to hand out to the children. And we encourage everyone to wear your favorite costume and come join in on the fun. Also, we are doing a food collection that day. Bring a canned good or many canned goods uh, for a donation to Christian Covered. Also, that same day, we are encouraging our 6th through 8th graders to come. This will be part of their Sunday fun day still beginning at 5.30, but we'd like for them to arrive at 5 to help us set up and to run a few games. So that will be part of their Sunday fun day is the trunk or treat. And we have uh, still continue to have on sale our Freedom's 125th anniversary t-shirt and cap fundraiser. We do have youth sizes in now, so make sure you see Shelly uh, following the service there in the narthex, and she'll take care of you. Today we uh, would like to remember in prayer, uh, Jerry Hudson's brother passed away, Doug Calloway, who lives in Houston. Please be in prayer for Jerry and her family. Uh, Lila Arlette's service, she passed away last week, um, will be tomorrow at Trace Hewell's uh, funeral home, and that service will be at 10 a.m. This afternoon is visitation there at Trace Hewell's. Uh, tomorrow's service will be at 10, followed by burial at Lone Oak across the street from the church. Please be in prayer for Gilbert, her husband, and son, Clint, and all the family in this loss. Also today we celebrate with Johnny and Jewel File. It is their 67th wedding anniversary. Wow, y'all must have been children. <laughs> Congratulations to you two. Uh, we celebrate with you the wonderful years of matrimony. So we're glad that you're part of our family. And now I'd like to call on Kyle Bodding, who has an announcement to share with us. Oh, okay. And Dave? Oh. Huh. Oh, do you need the microphone or do you want to stand next to me? <laughs> okay, uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And so in recognition of Dave and Sonia and your service to Freedom's Church, and I believe it'll be seven years in January that they've been with us here, uh, greatly appreciative of everything that you do uh, on behalf of the entire church congregation. I want to present you with this gift yeah, certificate. Thank you. So thank you very much from all of us. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you all so much for taking such good care of us, and we feel blessed to. Yeah, it's be a, a wonderful part of congregation and a wonderful place uh, to be. Uh, so thank you for the uh, the appreciation and the gifts and support. Um, there's five Sundays in October, Pastor Appreciation <laughs> Month. <laughs> One more to go. Oh, Dave. We uh, we we love you. We love you. We love being here. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> yes. I appreciate Dave. Yes, I do. Well, let us stand as we gather for worship. We have Madison schwartz leading us in our call to worship this morning. There. 
there will be silence. And there is light. There is music. And there is grace. There are people. And there is life. There is hope. And there is God. Let us worship well today. Let us indeed worship as we sing our opening praise song, Because of Your Love. we bring joy as we sing praise to God. And our next song today is Hail to the Lord's Anointed. As we lift up God, this is our hymn of praise. Take a 
how good and wonderful it is to hear the voices from you singing praise to God. It is definitely music and it's beautiful. And God hears it, we hears it. What a time it is. Friends, the presence of Christ is here. And through these few moments we have together, may now our spirits draw into God's great spirit to give us hope and courage, love and joy, and certainly peace. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us share and pass the peace of Christ with one another. Amen. Peace be with you. You may be seated, and I invite the children to come down front to join me for our children's moment. so quiet. It's not normal, is it? <laughs> you're still waking up, right? Is that what it is? Okay, I get it. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. And Pastor Dave is going to be talking about, in his sermon today, about a man who was blind, who couldn't see. Does anybody know, do you all know anyone who can't see like that? Who's blind? St. Paul. Paul, yeah, and the story? That's right. We studied that this summer in Vacation Bible School. Yeah. Um, he couldn't see for a little while. You don't know anybody personally in your life that is blind, they can't see at all? Well, I know someone that I actually met her a few years ago when I was leading a women's Bible sto story study. And she had become blind. Uh, she was an adult, and she started to lose her vision. And she would, had such a wonderful attitude about it, though. And she had to learn how to do things, but still being blind. And she taught me, as I was leading that time with, with the women, about how I needed to do some things differently so that she could participate. Because she used the sense of touch a lot and the sense of sound um, and even taste and smell to tell what was happening around her. And I learned that we can see in different ways other than just by our eyes. Did you know that? That we can sense in other things. And I bet y'all, if you closed your eyes when you were in your room at home, you could probably feel your way around knowing what was there because you've seen it a lot, right? And, but some people who are born who can't, blind and can't see, they learn from the very beginning how to be able to sense what people are around them, what things are around them, what they can touch and hear and taste and smell. And so the man that's in the story today that Jesus encounters has been blind for a long time. And he calls out to Jesus, and he knows that Jesus is the one who can cure him, that can help him see again. And so he believes already without seeing that Jesus is the one who heals, is the one that makes us better. And so he asks him to heal him, and Jesus says, by your faith has made you well. And so sometimes now, of course, if we pray and something happens, we may not always, if, if we're blind, we may not always be able to see, but guess what? God will help us be able to see in other ways, like by listening, by tasting, by smelling. You see how that works? That God helps us. If we just believe, then we'll be able to see. We'll be able to see how God is working in our lives. And God works in your lives all the time and how you are with each other, how you are with your families, how you show kindness and love. And that is believing. And then we see the results of that by how you're living your lives with Jesus along alongside you. That's right. 
Dear God, I thank you for these kids, these children, and the hearts that they have for you and how much they love you, and I know how much you love them. Oh God, help us to be able to believe before even seeing, because when we believe, we will be able to see you at work. It is in your name we pray. Amen. All right, boys and girls, you can go back to your seats. We have Ms. Warren in the back for those that are, can go to nursery five and under. And remember how much God loves you.
As we go to the Lord in prayer, let us be mindful of those in our community that are in need of our prayers, those in our church and our broader community as well. Let us begin with a time of silence where we reflect on God's presence that is here with us. Let us pray. Holy Creator, we fill the silence with your presence. Your presence that surrounds us, embraces us, and loves us. We give you thanks for hearing our prayers, for we indeed know that you hear us when we call out to you, when we cry out to you. And even when we don't take the time to pray, you know what's on our hearts. You know what we need. And so now we take that time to focus on what is needed in our lives and what you're calling us to do individually and corporately as a church. May we listen for your voice Maybe it comes in a still whisper, quiet, or perhaps it comes loud, or maybe it comes through music or the words of another person, or through tears, through laughter. You show up all the time in so many wonderful and various ways. Maybe be attentive to you as you are attentive to us. We lift up those that we have already shared in need of prayer, those that are grieving greatly the loss of a loved one. Be with them in this time of the shadow and the valley of death. May they know that you are with them, guiding them, giving light to their path, bringing comfort, and may we be part of bringing comfort by being present with them. Lord, we lift up those today who are on the journey of their lives ending, knowing that you are with them on that journey, you're with their families, and you will walk with them and embrace them. We pray for those facing surgery or other treatments, procedures. You know each situation, oh God, and we pray for healing to happen in the way that only you know how to do. We are reminded of that healing and the story of the blind man who is healed by Jesus, and he is able to see even beyond that vision through his eyes. May we and all that we do and say bring glory to your name as we strive to live our lives according to the gospel, according to the good news of Jesus Christ. And it is through the prayer that he taught his disciples that we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is, God, whose giving knows no ending. You see, we give unto God, and God is constantly giving to us in so many various ways. Pay attention to the words of this lovely hymn that speak of how God is constantly giving to us through Jesus Christ. If you're able, let us stand as we sing together.
last phrase, serving you by loving all, really does say it all, doesn't it? About the fact that as we serve, we are showing that love of Christ. As we give, as this song talks about, of our time, of our treasure, of the gifts that we have been given, you are so good at answering that call to give. And we ask God's blessings upon that giving today. And whenever we are called on, that we will say yes, that we will give of our time and talents and treasure because God gives up to us constantly. Let us respond by singing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Mark, Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cry, cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. This is one of several stories of Jesus healing this person, a blind beggar. It's in all the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and has different variations and different ways the story is told, but it's all about this wonderful event of Jesus healing. Jesus heals many people, not only the blind, but also the deaf and those who are lame. And for others, there's great healings that take place, these signs and wonders that happen. So I want you to watch this for a moment. It kind of sets the scene, the tone of what our story is about today. Julie will play our quick little video. Along with the rich and powerful, homeless outcasts often lined the roads in and out of Jericho because it was a good place to encounter the well-to-do traders and political elites. The Gospel of Luke tells us, as Jesus drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, and he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped. What do you want me to do for you? The blind beggar said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Luke 18, 35 through 43. That is the same story in Luke that we read about in Mark. It's also found oh. in Matthew. And there's also a similar story in the Gospel of John. So this is a very important story for us. But it's more than simply a nice, feel-good story. 
about a blind beggar coming to Jesus, asking to have his sight restored, and Jesus granting that. A miracle takes place, and he becomes happy, and he follows Jesus. That in itself is a wonderful, beautiful story. But as we know in the Gospels, there's so much more to the story, the meaning that is there, and why it is so important for us, as it was important for them that day. It had to be a difficult life for, for Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. Bar means son. So any time in the Bible you see Bar in front of a name, it means son of that person, Timaeus, whether he was Timaeus Jr. or just one of the sons of Timaeus, but he was a son of Timaeus, and he's blind, and he's begging. Why, why is he begging? Well, the world in which he had to live was very difficult for him especially. You see, anyone who was blind or deaf or lame, they were considered outcasts of the society. They didn't fit in, they didn't belong, and they were not included. As many of those who had other issues, whether it was leprosy or other physical issues, sometimes even mental issues, and they were just put away. I think because of this, First of all, who were the occupiers of the time? The Romans. The Romans had no use for blind people or deaf people, lame people. Had no use at all. They couldn't serve. They couldn't serve the empire. They couldn't work and pay taxes. They couldn't be a part of the Roman soldiers and the Roman army, and nor could they even be slaves. So the Romans had no use for them. Why bother with those who would be blind or lame, or deaf, or whatever issue that they had. They had no use for them at all. So they couldn't fit into that part of the world and society. And even more, more problematic, in my mind, and, and so heartbreaking, is even the religious elite had no use for this blind man because of their fear. You see, if the Romans did not have use for a blind man because of their contempt of his physical challenges, well, the religious elite did not because they were fearful, because they believed that he had to be cursed by God because of his blindness. Anyone who had this kind of situation in their life did not, were not blessed by God, they were cursed by God, and they didn't want to be cursed either. So they even asked people at the time, people asked Jesus, the religious elite, said, well, who, who in this man's family sinned? He or his parents. And Jesus said, this is not about sin. This is about someone's blindness. And so there was no place for him to fit in this society. So all he was left to do was sit beside the road and beg. And many of him, too, would go and beg. There's a whole group of beggars at times. And they would go to the main roads, this road to Jericho. You know that there were people going by, passing by, and he would hear them, and he would just shout out to them when he hear them, come and help me, can you help out this blind man? And some of those stories, there's more than, than just him. There's another person there, too, both blind and begging, just begging each and every day with no help, no help from those who had the means to help. The Romans were not going to help. The religious elite were not going to help because they were afraid of the cursedness they thought of this man. So he's left there just blind and begging. And Jesus does something quite remarkable. And he hears this man. But something very important, too, is happening that we cannot overlook. The words that he says to them, he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth who was coming, and, and he had heard the stories. By this time, Jesus is well into his ministry, and the word of Jesus and the stories of Jesus have been spreading throughout the land. And he had heard, I'm sure, with very acute ears, oh, this Jesus of Nazareth, he's the one who is healing people. He's the one who they call Messiah. If I can only get close to him, what can I do? And so he, heard, he hears that it's Jesus, along with the disciples and followers there in Jericho. And Jesus and disciples and followers are going to Jerusalem for where the big event is going to happen later on. And he says to them, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then something very interesting happens. Because it says in the Bible that many who were there, disciples, followers, they were there, 
sternly ordered him to be quiet. Why? Why would they want this blind beggar to be quiet? Well, here's the reason why. It's not just that he wants mercy. It's the titles he gives to Jesus, Jesus, son of David. For you see, that title alone is politically charged in that environment. You see, son of David means that Jesus is Messiah. He is the long-awaited Messiah. And other people in charge did not want to hear that. That would get people in trouble because often it did. You see, Jesus was not the first one in that time to be considered a new Messiah for the people. Their idea of Messiah for these Jewish people was someone like David again. And Solomon, some, a king, someone who would come and restore their fortunes, get rid of the Romans, make the temple prominent again, make their land prominent again, waiting for this military Messiah. And the Romans didn't like this either, but they thought, oh no, here we go, not more Messiah talk again. How many times do we have to get rid of these would-be kings who threaten our empire, threaten our emperor? We don't want to hear it. So anytime someone would use son of David or Messiah, it was charged words. And those heard it said, no, please be quiet. You're going to get us all in trouble. And disciples had just come through this process with Jesus at Caesarea Philippi, where he says to them, who, who do you say that I am? And they had a moment of truth, a moment of reckoning, where they said, you are indeed the Son of God, the Messiah. And Jesus says, don't tell anyone that yet, because Jesus knows that when that word gets out, then all the trouble starts brewing. And it was that same charge of being Messiah is what Jesus got, got Jesus arrested by the Romans to begin with and sent to the cross. It's not just a nice saying coming from the words of this beggar, Bartimaeus, son of David. It was charged. And it said, no, be quiet. But he would not stop. He cried out even more loudly, son of David. I don't care what you guys are saying. I know he's son of David. Messiah, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops and says, call him here. And he gets up quickly throwing off his cloak, and he goes to Jesus. And Jesus wants to make sure, make sure, why have you come? Other people come to Jesus not out of the real reasons Jesus wants them to come to him. Sometimes people come to Jesus because of what they can gain from Jesus. Even the disciples struggled with this. Even after Jesus told them who he was and what he was about, they said, oh, well, that's great, Jesus, but oh, by the way, James and John said, when we get to this new kingdom now in Jerusalem, can one of us sit at the right hand and left hand at you on your throne so we can be the leaders too now? And Jesus says, you don't understand what I'm talking about. Peter at times didn't understand. The disciples didn't understand until well after the time of resurrection. And perhaps sometimes we don't even understand too what it means for Jesus to really heal us and save us in life, especially if we're thinking about only how it affects us and not truly following Jesus. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? How many of you have included that kind of a statement in a prayer? Jesus. God, here are the list of things I need for you to do for me today. And we'll go down through those things, things I want, I need. It could be all kinds of things, sometimes things at the moment. If you've not prepared well, either for school or a job, you may say, oh, Lord, help me now. I need your divine intervention at this very moment. Or there's something you're just wanting, desiring. I remember at times as a child that when I was looking at, you know, my, my Christmas list, and I'm thinking, and I'd go to, to, uh, at night with my prayers, and after I'd pray with my mom every night, the next part of my unspoken prayer was, oh God, I really, really want these things on this Christmas list. And then I begin some kind of bargaining. If I get this, then I will do all the things you want me to do, oh, oh God, I'll even go to church. And so sometimes it's a bargaining chip that we use with God. What do you want me to do for you? And he was truthful he was honest he said not that oh okay 
Kind of like, you know, the three wishes you might get from that genie. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the three wishes you would have if you got the three wishes? What would those three wishes be? What is the first one? Oftentimes, the first one is, oh, I want a million dollars. A million dollars. And oh, I've got two more wishes after that. Then you start thinking of some personal things. I want to be taller. I want to be faster, stronger, smarter. I want to be better looking. And oh, oh, by the way, I'd like to go on a trip sometime. Your three wishes. And no telling what those three wishes are going to be. Oftentimes when we think about the three wishes that we wish for in life, it has to do about so much for yourself. And Bartimaeus simply says, my teacher... Rabbi, let me see again. Let me see again. That was it. Not let me see, and oh, by the way, have riches. Not let me see, and so I don't have to beg anymore. Not let me see and have all these other things that might be added unto me. Just simply let me see again. What it is to see. And I want us to see this today, that this is more than simply a wonderful story about someone now having their sight, their physical sight restored. You see, every moment when Jesus does something, and why this is important, is not just the physical event that's taking place, the deeper meaning is the spiritual event taking place. That somehow blind Bartimaeus, this beggar, on the side of the road, can see Jesus for who he really is even more than the followers who were with them, who could see very well. They were only seeing Jesus the way they wanted to see Jesus, through their own eyes, what Jesus would be for them, how they would gain, and not seeing that there is love in this matter where this man can be restored back into the community. He just wants to belong again. And Jesus says to him, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he he regains his sight. And he doesn't just go, he follows. Isn't that interesting? He follows Jesus on the way. On the way where? Well, right now it's going to be on the way to Jerusalem. It's going to be on the way to the cross, but also be on the way to resurrection, on the way to new life. He doesn't just go. He doesn't just leave. He got what he wanted, then he walks away. How many times has it happened in our own lives where you've done something for someone and they say, oh, that's great, and then they just go and they leave and they're on their own way. Jesus says, get up and come. Go, your faith has made you well. He says, yes, my faith has made me physically well. But even before that, his faith was already spiritually well, and he follows Jesus on the way. What does it take for us in the world today to really get up and follow Jesus on the way of life? You see, it's not just physical blindness. It is spiritual blindness for so many people in life. It's not just the things physically that that hurt us and cause us problems. Oftentimes, it's also spiritual things in our lives. And we have to understand, too, when we're looking at the world, that we cannot be motivated by, by contempt for people because of limitations like the Romans did, nor can we be motivated by fear because of our fear of people not being blessed by God. No, we must be motivated by what Christ does and is motivated out of love by Christ and of Christ in the world. That is our motivation. When the world, when the world needed hospitals, who, when they had a chance, started building the hospitals? It was the church. When the world needed education for children and everyone else in the world, who formed and built the schools? It was the church. Who then was out there in this world providing ways for people not already not already receiving what they needed in the world, oftentimes being ostracized and outcast by the world. It's the church that steps up when they're motivated by the love of Christ, not out of contempt, not out of fear, but God's love. God's love. That's why today, that's why today, all around this country, it's a beautiful thing to see schools for the blind. That never existed before. Schools for the blind and for the deaf. And now the blind even have their own language. 
and they can use the language. And you see this language all the time. If you've ever ridden on an elevator, you know that it's Braille by, by the room, uh, the levels of the, of the hotel where they're going, where the elevator is going to go. If you cross the crosswalk in an urban center, you can hear, hear the clicks, the noises, the sounds for the seconds left to get across the street safely. What motivates that? Not contempt, not fear, but love. Let's help them out. What a great world that is. And so many other things, too, in life. You see what we've been able to do as a society is some wonderful things when we're no longer limited by our contempt and by our fear, but when we allow that to just go away and be motivated by Christ's love because of what Christ has done for the world, then great things can happen. You see, that's the great miracle of Christ. Every time there was a healing, every time there was a great miracle, a great event, signs and wonders by Christ, the Bible says, new things happen. That's why we feed the poor. Feed the masses, because Christ did so. That's why we do it. That's why we help the blind, because Christ did so. Help the lame, because Christ did so. Help the poor and the lonely, the outcast, because Christ did so. When we do that, we're being Christ in the world. And sometimes, boy, do we get it right. We get it right so often. There are... No more prouder moments that I have at times when I can take food like you guys do to Christian Cupboard and to Navarro schools. Or sometimes, too, we can go and we can purchase some basic and inexpensive household items for a family just in need. Why? Because you help make that happen. And next Sunday is a fifth Sunday of the month. And the greatest appreciation you can show me and Sonny and anybody else is your contribution to the Matthew 25 offering because we use that offering to help people in need. Why? Not out of contempt, not out of judgment, not out of fear, out of love. And it's a wonderful, beautiful thing to do so. And it helps to see, to see better in all of life to get to a place in life where you can see the world and you can see those who might not be fitting in or belonging. Maybe they're outcasts. Maybe they're troubled. Maybe they're hurting. And to be the presence of Christ and then just see the change in life that can be. That's why we show up. We show up at times and places where other people will not go because the love of Jesus Christ. That makes all the world. So let me ask you a question today. How are you feeling? How are you feeling physically? It seems that most of the conversations I have now with people, with other people and myself, have to do with continuing and seemingly growing physical limitations. I just don't feel good all the time anymore. I don't understand why. I asked a doctor that one day, and I said, you know, how come I'm not looking as good, I'm not feeling as good, I can't seem to run and do these things? He said, because Dave, you're old. You're old, Dave. You're not, you're not 28 any, anymore. I said, I refuse to believe that. I refuse to believe that because I, my heart is in it, if not my brain sometimes. But now we talk about things and limitations and things that can go wrong and will go wrong. And sometimes we're thinking, will anything be right again? And not just that physically, but the things and how we feel emotionally. and spiritually, and mentally. And sometimes it's like, like, is anything wrong? And the answer is, well, everything's wrong. Nothing ever feels good. But what we know about the life of Christ is this. There is nothing wrong that love can't fix. Nothing. Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. We know this truth now because of Jesus Christ. Maybe one time before, yes, people had no hope. Bartimaeus had no hope sitting on the side of the road. He's tried to get by day by day, enough food, enough water to get through that day. No hope, hoping that someone might come by, but no hope that he could ever help himself until that one day when Jesus walks by. Have you had moments in your life when Jesus walks by? And here is what this is meaningful and important for us today. It's when Jesus matters the most. 
Jesus won't matter the most to some people if they don't feel they need Jesus at all. Jesus won't matter most to them. Sometimes people have everything they need. They're okay. They're feeling good physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. They're feeling good. They don't really maybe need that Jesus. But everybody's going to need Jesus at some point in our lives when the world can just bring us to our knees and there's nowhere else to go. Now we're begging ourselves to feel better, to be better. Jesus, help my heart. Jesus, help my mind. Jesus, help my spirit. And that's the very moment Jesus says to us, so what do you really want me to do for you? And then when we're honest in our response, that's the moment healing takes place. The miracle happens. Go, your faith has made you well. And then we follow. Right now, there's so many people in our own church who are hurting in a number of ways. Who will be there to help them out? Let us be there for them as we're there for others. There are people in our community, in this world, who are hurting today, even though they may seem like everything is going their way, but we have to know what's going on, on the inside of people. Sometimes I'll ask people, hey, how are you doing? And they'll say, well, I'm doing fine. And then I'll follow up and say, well, how are you really doing? And then the truth comes out. Well. Here's what's really happening in my life. And that's when the real conversations happen. That's when Jesus matters the most. I think my, my personal observation and belief is this, is that there's still room for people and a place for the church in this world in whatever way that we can be. Someone has to be the, the, the people who say to the world, what do you want Christ to do for you? Tell us and let us help you. And then let's make faith great. There's still a need for that. I know life is different and things change and church may not have the place that it used to have in the roles of life of people in the community, but it's still necessary. It's still necessary. There's still going to be people in a very different way, seemingly on their own road of life, blind, maybe deaf, maybe hungry. Even though they have 20-20 vision, they can hear everything and they have plenty of food. But spiritually, they're still not where they need to be in life. And they're just quietly, silently, begging, 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 day after day after day. And we have hope. We have hope for them, my friends, greater than anything else in the world. That is the love of Christ. God's love can fix anything if we want it to happen. We'll call this the Freedom's Fix-It Shop for a little while. Come on in. Bring yourselves. Oh, I can't fix much of anything that you really, really might have in life. I, I can barely change the oil in, in the car anymore. And, and flat tires, you should see us trying to get air in our tires. It goes from you know 25 to 38 in a heartbeat. Now we've got all kinds of tire pressures going on, and my car is going crazy. Hey, your front tire is 28, your back tire is 38, this one is 14, and this one is 32 perfect. What can you do? We're driving around that way in all of life, and it seems like it's hard every day. We go to the doctor trying to get fixed, go to the dentist trying to get fixed. Oh, we're trying to help or repair ourselves, knowing that some days, it's just hard. And we're with our families and our children and our neighbors and our co-workers, and things are just, just hard each day. It can be, and it can get to a point when it all piles up to think like we're just begging and begging and begging. That's the moment when Jesus matters the most. And we're to help you and the world on the way with Christ. Let's pray. 
Oh, holy God, we give you thanks for the great love you have for us, and we know that most fully in the life of Jesus Christ. Help us to look at these stories now with, with closer attention and detail with our own eyes and through our own minds and through spirit that we can learn and learn more, especially how we can increase our love for you and our love for neighbor each and every day. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn today is a wonderful variation on the wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace. Let these words now flow from you with great faith as we sing and live this out. Let us stand and sing together. <clears throat> But 
the chains of contempt and fear are gone. It's now love that motivates all that we do with all of our ministries here, whether it be counseling services and building ramps and feeding and just helping out because of God's great love for us all. We live it out. So this week, be that and live it out the best you can. Help those along the way to follow the way. Next Sunday, remember, it's Matthew 25 offering, and on Sunday afternoon, we'll have our trunk or treat. We're going to be set up right out behind me here in this parking lot, a little more shade out there. So come bring your trunks, your trucks, your wagons, your trailers, whatever it is that you want to decorate to next week, and we'll have just a good time uh, together. So my friends today, God is with you. God loves you. God always has. You are a child of God every moment. Live that way the best you can. And along the way, may we strive to live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, and pray daily, and leave everything else to God. Amen. It all comes down to this. Oh, oh. 